Hi, good afternoon, everyone. We will be starting the session momentarily. I'm just asking if you can please allow us five more minutes before we, before we get everything set up, okay? Good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Van Sturden. I'm the Commuting External Affairs Chairperson. And we're about to begin right now. It's all right. So I'd like to welcome everyone for our first um, episode of the series, Self-Defense. And I'd like to start it off by inviting Jamel Brown to give us a word of prayer to invite a large presence in our event. Jamel, please go ahead and your word of prayer, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, fellow commuters, and good afternoon um, to everybody again. My name is Jamel Brown, Executive Assistant. I am here today to do the opening prayer. Um, join me in and right now. Dear, um, dear Heavenly God above, I pray that you cover this event today and give us the knowledge that we need and the knowledge that we deserve. I pray that everybody here gets the knowledge that they want so that they can properly um, defend it themselves in the future. I pray unto you, O Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. 
May the good Lord go with us. That's it, guys. Okay, thank you very much for that prayer, Mr. Jamel Brown. And Jamel Brown is our executive assistant on the Gill Commuting Students Committee. So continuing with the program. So the self-defense series is started last year under the first um, the commuting external affairs person then, Ramona Davis, self-defense, was part of her manifesto. And our commuters rep, Mr. Justin Edwards, said he will continue this initiative and like to give Mr. Justin Edwards the opportunity to talk about why this program was continued and what are the goals or objectives of this program. Go ahead, Mr. Edwards. Okay, thank you so much, Dave. And so good afternoon, guys, and welcome to the first of, I'm hoping what will be a very successful uh, series that is really centered on self-defense. So from the, from the campaigning season, um, one of my manifesto points was really geared towards a year long campaign towards um, safety and security for students. And this self-defense series it, um, started as an initial uh, as an initial event by the EAC last year. And we wanted to continue it to kind of equip our students with what is necessary to keep themselves safe from a personal standpoint, um, as well as working with administration to ensure that from an infrastructural and uh, initiative-based um, aspect, we also cater towards student safety. So it took the form of giving them lessons and teaching them, you know, the simple techniques that they can make use of if they find themselves in a situation where, you know, they're, they're unsafe, they're being um, accosted with a weapon or unarmed, that kind of thing. But for this now, seeing that we are online, we really have opted that for the first uh, if episode, as you might call it, of this series, we deal with cybersecurity. So what you find is that seeing as we are online and use of social media and being online uh, is, is, is go has gone up, you find that there are other issues that, that come into play, whether it has to deal with um, online transactions where you know you need to be uh, safe to, to, to safeguard your, your actual online profile in regards to your funds, as well as even just your social media profiles, you have to be very careful of, of, of persons that will seek to target students and, and try to cause them harm over the internet as well as even just your personal image online. So a lot of persons don't even realize just how important it is to safeguard their personal profiles online because even when you go for any job interview or that kind of thing, the first thing that some of these, these um, corporate entities do is go and search your name online, check your Facebook, your Twitter to find out the type of person that you are. So it's a very interesting spin on um, the idea of self-defense and I'm definitely looking forward to hearing from the speakers and seeing um, what they have to offer and to say to us as students. So thank you guys so much for being here and I hope you guys enjoy the session. Thank you, Mr. Justin Edwards, our chairman for commuting students for the great background. So continuing the program, we have our first speaker, Ms. Malika Ricketts. Before she comes, let me share some background information about her. One moment, please. Malika Ricketts is an achiever from a very young age when she attained a JN Bank scholarship, which helped her throughout her years of high school from 2012 to 2017. She later progressed into assuming roles of leadership as a prefect of the Yarkasa High School in St. Anne, and also becoming one of the top Cape awardees in 2018. Now, as a student of the UE Mona, she is pursuing a degree in psychology and a minor in anthropology. She's introverted, yet sociable, in one go. Although her career is centered around advocacy for mental health, she too has a passion for the culinary arts, having her own cooking page and Instagram at Malika Kitchen. And I'm sure Malika would like to share that Instagram link in the chat 
So all of us can go on and follow that page for those who are interested. Currently in the process of writing her home cooking book, she spends her time sharing new recipes and tricks in the kitchen. Alongside her everyday hobby, she's also ambassador for the Jamaica National Group. And she serves in a leadership role. Of, she's also a part of the Gill PR committee. She learns the importance of marketing her brand. Lastly, she feels as though the role she assumes now would eventually groom her in becoming an influencer for her community in the years to come. So please let uh, Mr. Kids feel welcome. Okay. Or could we um, unmute and clap so we can have a diversity? Would we all un unmute and clap? All right, thank you very much, everyone. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so today I'll be sharing some tips with you as it relates to navigating your on online in a safe and secure way from an online banking perspective. Um, Davion, am I going to be sharing the screen or will you? Hello? Oh, oh, yes, Malika. I didn't hear that. Oh, I'm asking if I should be sharing the screen or will you? No, you can share the screen. You can share your screen. Okay, all right. So. Okay, so today we're going to be speaking about cybersecurity. I want to ask you first, anyone, what do you think cybersecurity is? You can either unmute yourself or you can text in the chat. Anyone can answer. Hello, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Um, well, what I think cybersecurity is, is protecting yourself while using online resources, protecting your information and your identi identity where necessary. Yes, you are correct. And I also see a response here from Ashley Nicole Lauren. She says being safe in a virtual world, which is actually true as well. So, my connection are you guys hearing me because i'm not sure if my internet connection is stable oh yes we're hearing oh you're hearing me okay why is this not going to next second because i don't know why it's not going to the other slide so just give me a second Bear with me, please. Let me see if I can stop sharing and then try again. Okay, yes. So cybersecurity is the practice of defending computers, servers, mobile devices, electronic systems, network, and data from malicious attacks, i.e. hackers. So malicious attacks meaning hackers who try to probably use different devices or different means to get onto your device and potentially steal your banking credentials or your personal information. So I'm going to be sharing now sharing some tips to keep your online banking safe whenever conducting transactions online. So the first tip is 
protect your personal information. So if you make banking transactions with your phone or any other device, it is very important to guard your personal information by setting up a screen lock. The phone must be automatically, automatically locked if it is not being used for a specific period of time. So to, in doing so, you know that you have your personal information on your phone. For example, your credit card details and everything. The responsible thing to do is to always have a screen lock. You're not only protecting yourself from hackers, but also persons who don't have any good intentions, persons who want to steal information from you. Also, never use banking credentials on a public Wi-Fi. Can anyone tell me why do you think a public Wi-Fi is not safe? Anyone, you can text in the chat. It doesn't matter. I'll try and read your responses. Okay, I see somebody in the chat here. Being VPN is not secure. Well, that is true. And also you have the potential of a middleman attack. So with a public Wi-Fi, actually do they act as a middleman so they will go in between basically virtually in between the public wi-fi and you being connected and actually get onto your device and be able to steal all information possible from your device and move it move it to other remote trackers so you should never carry out any banking transactions while your phone is connected to a public wi-fi the safe thing to do is use a a trusted Wi-Fi or a Wi-Fi to which your phone or you are familiar with. Okay, be careful of the apps you download on your phone. So before downloading any app on your phone, make sure that it is genuine. There are many fake banking apps which look exactly like the original one. These fake apps are set up with the intention of stealing your personal information so it's always necessary to use a, an official source. So if you have an Android, always download banking apps from the Google Play Store, or if you have an Apple device, an iOS app store. That's key. Also, conduct your transactions on is it safe or it's dangerous, potentially malicious, is to look at the URL address. URL addresses with HTTPS are the safe websites. If it doesn't have the S in there, that means that it's, it may not be safe, right? So the S is actually stands for secure. So anytime you see HTTPS, know that you're in safe hands when conducting business on that website. So transactions on such website can also set you up for personal risk, of course dealing of banking credentials and personal information. Monitor your bank account periodically. I cannot stress this enough because sometimes these are this is what they do. They take their time and they steal information and also your money from your account. So it is also it is always good to monitor If you see where a transaction is done that is not to your knowledge, the first thing to do is to report it to the bank, right? And that is one of the benefits with JN Bank Online. You're able to view your transaction history as well as the date um, the transaction history was, the transaction was carried out. Also, enable bank account alerts. This is very necessary because you want to always know when your card is being used. So whenever, whenever a bank activity, whenever a bank activity, alert of the information. For that, you may need to um, opt for a special alert offered by the bank for probably a, a fee, of course. But generally, it's supposed to be free. So always necessary to set up these bank account alerts to know that when your card is being used, even if it's not to your knowledge, so that you can take the necessary precautions or actions when this happens. Also, never share sensitive banking information. 
So you may have somebody call you on the phone saying, okay, I'm calling from Jane Bank. There's an issue with your account. I'm going to need your credit card information or I'm going to need some form of personal information from you, right? Never give out personal information or banking details over the phone. This is very dangerous because you have what you call sales hackers. These are professional hackers who basically what they do is pretend to be trusted entities in order to get your banking details. So in order, anytime banking information has to be given out, it is usually done face to face. So you'd have to go into the bank in order to give them such details. They won't call you over the phone asking for your credit card details. So when this happens, this should raise alert for you and for you not to give out such information to these persons. Beware of phishing emails. This is very important. Phishing is a type of social engineering attack often used to steal the user's data, including their login credentials and their credit card numbers. It occurs when an attacker is masquerading as a trusted entity, dupes or deceives a victim into opening an email, instant message or a text message. So phishing emails are very dangerous. Some of them have bad links that will carry you to websites that automatically or immediately it takes off, it probably will put a virus or a malicious entity, malicious entity on your, on your device. So to be able to identify a phishing email, I'm going to show you this example here. So as you see, you look at the fake email address. Sometimes you um when from a trusted source, it's not going to come from a generic email address, for example, at gmail.com. If it's like, if you're getting, a, for example, an email from Jane Bank, it's going to be at janebank.com. You're not going to receive it from a generic email address. So that is one thing to look out for at first. Also, even an email, open it with caution. Observe the necessary, um, Observe the necessary details that you have to before opening a link. Look at how they address you. If they say, dear customer, that is too generic. Any business that you're conducting, most businesses more than likely will know your name. So if they're contacting you, they're going to address you by your name. So that's one key thing to look out for as well. Also look at the urgency. If they're asking you for your credit card information and they're saying that they need it now, this can, um, raise a, some, some sort of suspicion, right? So you have to look at the urgency in which they're asking for some of these information. Also look at the poor grammar. Trusted businesses, most of them, in fact, all of them, when they send out their emails, they do their necessary spell checks and whatever it is they have to do. So you also have to look out for poor grammar and also look out for bad links. Links that are contain a lot of letters and numbers very long. Some of these links are actually dangerous and may have viruses connected to them. <clears throat> Sorry. So never click, never click on a bad link. Yes. <clears throat> Sorry. So never click. Should be, should be aware of. Enable a two-factor authentication. Give me a minute, guys. I don't know what just happened. Okay, sorry about that. So enable a two-factor authentication. So this is a one-time password that is usually sent to your email or your mobile device to complete a banking transaction. So basically, you set up an account using your phone, right? If you sign into that, that account by any means to another device, they would send a, a, a password. It is actually you who who is the person, the, you, the person 
actually signing on to this account. So this is actually a security measure that you can take in order to ensure that nobody hacks your account or tries to steal your information. And which brings me to one of um, Jane Bank's security measures that we take due diligence in as it relates to our online banking platform. So when you set up your online banking, the first thing you do is you have to, you must have your username and your password, right? You cannot get in unless you have your username and password. Also, when you go in, at the time of applying for the online banking, you would have you would have been asked for a security image or to select a security image. Only you would know which security image image you would have selected at. That you selected, right? So hackers, even when they try to bypass this, they're going to have to know these necessary information in this necessary information in order to get into your bank account. Also, if they so happen to, if they cannot get in, they also ask them, they will also ask them the necessary security questions that would that you would have been asked at the time of signing up for the online banking. So for example, they're gonna ask you which city were you born, your mother's maiden name, all those necessary questions just to ensure that you are the person who is signing into your account and not a potential hacker, right? So, and also when you sign into your account, this only allows you to view your banking information, probably your, yeah, view your banking information. However, as it relates to transacting money, per se, you would have to go into another, um, another part of the website and actually um, put in your login, tra your transaction password. So, right, so you have many different security measures to ensure that your money is not as Jane Bank take with our customers to ensure your safety while still remaining connected digitally. Right, so that is the end of my presentation. I do, I do hope that you, you may have learned a thing or two from it. And I'll leave this thing, this this quote with you. Actually, one single vulnerability is an is all attacker needs. So if you take the necessary precautions, then more than likely you will always remain safe when conducting your business online. So always remember to take these necessary precautions before doing any form of banking transactions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Ricketts, for that lovely presentation. It was very detailed. And I know going forward, and I'll definitely be safe doing anything online pertaining to banking. All right, so we, if, yes, are there any questions for Ms. Ricketts? Any questions from the participants? Okay, so thank, thank you again, Mr. Kitts. And we are continuing with our program. So we're asking the commuting students PRO for this academic year, Ashley Nicole Lawrence, to introduce our next speaker. Go ahead, Ms. Lawrence. Good afternoon, everyone. He's a Good afternoon. Good afternoon. He's a final year student at the Norman Manley Law School, who is passionate about youth development, advocacy, volunteerism, and policy development. He currently serves as a legal consultant for the Guild of Students of the University of the West Indies Mona campus, where he completed his Bachelor of, Art, Bachelor of Law degree. He's an alumnus of Cornwall College, where he served in numerous leadership capacities. He has represented the Jamaican delegation at the International Rotary Youth Leadership Awards in St. Martin, and Washington DC at the fifth Caribbean Youth Leadership Summit, as well as a delegate at the Cloud Computing and Big Data Construction and Application for Jamaican officials in China in 2018. He was also a participant in the 2017 UNESCO Jamaica Youth Advisory Committee Forum. He served as youth coordinator of the Montego Bay South Division where he developed 
youth groups in communities in and around St. James through various projects, campaigns, and social interventions. He also served as a member of the National Youth Parliament of Jamaica 2016-2017. This inspired him to form the St. James Youth Leadership Organization. He was installed as a Governor General's I Believe Initiative Ambassador, ambassador in 2017 and was later awarded the Governor General's Achievement Award for the Parish of St. James. He contends that the key to success is believing that you can accomplish anything you can set out to do, as long as you have the right mentality and willingness to work hard. Everyone, help me welcome Mr. Demore Carr. Thank you very much, Ashley for that um, wonderful introduction. For a second, I was wondering if you were actually speaking about me, um, to be honest. But um, I do appreciate that very warm welcome. And uh, Mr. Sterling, I want to thank you and your team for having me. Um, before I begin, I would just like to kindly ask if everyone could unmute their microphones. Let us see this trial and let's see how it goes. Um, I want this session to be as engaging as possible. I won't speak long. And um, to be quite frank, uh, Miss Ricketts really covered a lot of the things that I thought I would have been speaking about today. So um, with that said, Mr. Edwards did raise um, a few points in which I think I want to expound on, particularly with regards to social media and um, its, its, its importance <clears throat> with um, marketing ourselves as young professionals. So I'm asking everyone to unmute their microphones. Um, if there are any roosters crowing in the background or dogs, um, we'll listen out for them and then we'll, we'll decide whether or not we want to mute that microphone or not. But um, for right now, I want everyone to unmute their microphones. Let's see how this, this plays out. I will call names. I'm seeing every participant. There are 15 participants here. Not sure how many persons have joined us on the live. Um, so sound check. Justin, are you hearing me? Yes, sir. I'm hearing you loud and clear. Good, good. Um, Brianna, are you hearing me? Yes, Mr. Kerr. Hearing good, good. You. Ashley, how about you? Hearing you loud and clear. Excellent, excellent. Who else, who else? I know Davian is hearing me, correct? Yes, that is correct. That is correct. Good, good. I'm still waiting on a few persons to unmute their microphones. I'm wondering if they are falling asleep. Hearing you, hearing you. You're hearing, good, good. Janelle, Joy, and Kerisha, Shania, Stephen. Hearing you, Lord and Claire. Yeah, I hear you. Excellent. What about Janelle and Jamel and Joanne, the three J's? Hearing. Hearing. Ashley, Nicole, are you hearing me? Ashley. Hearing you loud and clear. Excellent. Kerisha, all right, you're missing the thumbs up. And I want me to hear the roof stand at the background, but it's all right. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Mm. All right. Um, without further ado, to be very honest with you, when um when Davian asked me to to speak about the do's and don'ts of online surfing, I was very honest with him in my response, which was, Boy, my brethren. That is not really my area of expertise and it will require me to do some research, right? However, I will try my best to make this as fun and engaging as possible. I don't know why I'm not on mute, why I'm not, um, on mute back the mic there, you know. So, in my pursuit of trying to make this as fun and exciting as I possibly can, I want to start off by playing a little game that may be a bit taboo and it will require us 
to be verbal, which is why I've asked everyone to unmute their microphones. Now, while some of the things I may say in my presentation may overlap with Malika, it's very important that everyone understands their rights, not only as students, but as citizens when it comes to the digital space. With that being said, I want to play the game, Never Have I Ever. Now, I won't ask you to get a glass and pour out any alcohol in that glass. I won't ask you to, right? But the rules are very simple and they're as follows. I want all participants to use their discretion as to whether or not they would like to participate. That's the first thing. The second thing is that I don't want anyone to incriminate themselves. But if you will participate, I'm asking that you be as honest as possible for learning purposes. I will not judge, but I can't speak for your colleagues, right? So Jamel, Joy, and Justin, Kerisha, Shere, I don't want to mispronounce anyone's name. Stephen, may I beg you to please unmute the mic them if you can. If not, I understand. All right. So, when you ready for the first one? I hope everyone is hearing me clearly. Yes, clearly. Yes, hearing. All right, good. The first one is, and for those of us who can't unmute our microphones, I just ask you to use the raise hand feature. Cool? All right. Never have I ever shared any of my electronic passwords with anyone else. Oh, yes, I have shared. I've shared my password. <laughs> All right, Davian. Davian is guilty. Who else is guilty? I, I have shared. I have. Excellent, excellent. So we have a few guilty people here. All right. Never have I ever visited an unsafe website. I, I have, have. have to watch series. I have. <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> all right, all right. Never have I ever downloaded an illegal movie. Ooh, I have. Whoa. Whoa. Not, I have, not, I have. Not. I have. Okay, all right. <clears throat> Never have I ever agreed to terms and conditions without reading them. Every day. <laughs> All the time. I see. I see. remember. I'm not here to judge you. I may or may not be guilty of a few of these myself. I will not incriminate myself. Never have I ever downloaded a VPN. I have. I have. I have. I have. I have. I have. Once. All right. And the final one is never have I ever tried to search for the free version of something that ought to be paid for. For example, a book, a movie, a game, et cetera. Every day. Uh, yeah. I, have, I, have. <laughs> I have, I have. All right. Free microphone. There we go. So we all have been guilty of at least one or a few of these, um, I wouldn't say crimes, but a few of these instances where the morality of searching the web comes into question. And I made a particular note of the persons who are innocent because of course, in my opinion, it means that these persons have been aware of the do's and don'ts of searching the web or flow may not be flowing in their direction just yet. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so fortunately, our country has been developing in the 
online space, particularly with respect to understanding our rights as citizens, so much so that earlier this year, specifically Tuesday, May 19th, approximately five months ago, the data protection bill was made an act. So the data protection act now provides that personal data cannot be transferred to any jurisdiction outside of Jamaica, which is any other country outside of Jamaica, unless Jamaica ensures an adequate level of protection for the rights of its citizens. There are also strict standards that determine how the information is to be processed, right? Now, with that being said, there has been a call for vast public education in the form of a public education campaign. Because when it comes to cyber security, all of us are vulnerable, right? And I'm sure we can all attest to knowing at least one person who has in some way, shape or form been a victim of cyber security, whether it be some online attack as Malika presented on, um, some credit card fraud or some exposure on social media, it's all cyber security, right? And the breach thereof. So it's very important that we all as citizens know not only our rights as citizens with regards to our, our um, identity and the protection of our identity, but the online space in which we will all navigate, especially in, during this COVID period when we are all being urged to turn away yard. So the first thing is that we need or ought to all be aware of what the Data Protection Act speaks to with regards to the sharing of our personal information. Now, I want to speak freely, right? And I want to share an experience. I went to China in 2018, and I won't be long, trust me. I, I doubt I'll be speaking for more than 15 minutes or 10. I went to China in 2018, and that gave me the opportunity to see how a developed country utilizes its data in a very real way. They have an application, I would call it, known as WeChat. And WeChat is basically like a national identification system. You can pay your bills online. You can use WeChat to do almost everything virtually. And in reality, it translates to, to reality. There were some concerns that I had, seeing that I'm from a third world country, right? And we know that anytime we hear of data being shared, especially with regards to our country, our state, utilizing our own information, where a lot of things like, oh, it's going to be the mark of the beast, and you know, this is immoral, and this is an invasion of privacy, and all of that. While those arguments are substantial, at the same time, what information does, and I want to say this unequivocally, the most valuable asset in this world is not just money, is not just any other material thing that you may think of, it's information. And an example of this is when you go on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and you search for some, or Pinterest, and you search for something that you like, almost a week after that, you may be wondering to yourself, 
how am I only seeing advertisements which are that are relating to the thing that I search for or the things that I search for? It's because the information that you type in or you give to whomever is being stored and it may or may not be shared to third parties who may have an interest financially or otherwise in providing you with what you are seeking for. So information is very, very, very valuable, right? And that was an aside, but I think it was very important that I said that. So not only is public education important, but we are to protect our identity. And there are a number of ways in which you can protect your, your online identity. Unfortunately, when you are making an email address, it does ask you for some very detailed information that you may or may not be able to, to go around. But it is very important that we read and I'm glad how we played that, that game earlier that showed you how much we don't read because we accept terms and conditions for a number of things without reading them. The first thing we see when we are about to accept a term or a condition is paragraphs upon paragraphs of words, which for the most part may not mean one thing to us or we may not even understand what we're reading. And even if we do understand, we say to ourselves, me not have time for this. We also say to ourselves, whether I'm read this or not, whether I'm, whether I'm read this or not, I will still have to access it. I will still have to accept it if I want this service provided to me. Right? So it's 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 intuitive, and that is a reality. And what it's one that we unfortunately we have to face. But we are to be cautious of what we are accepting, right? There are fine prints that are very important and we may or may not sell ourselves short when we opt to not read before we sign. The pen is much mightier than the sword, right? Now, it's also worth using a password management system. Um, some of us said that we shared our passwords with other people. That is a no-no. Do not share your password with anyone. No matter how much you may feel that you trust them, the issue is sometimes not the people you share it with, right? The issue is sometimes who may have access to that information outside of whom you've shared it with because anything can happen to a device if you're sharing if you're if you're saving all of your passwords on your, your cellular phone whether it be memo pad or password keeper or whatever one day you may just leave your phone open and someone can take it up and they may or may not have access to all of that information so you have to be very cautious of where you save your passwords and manage your passwords um very keenly right um another important point is that you keep your social networks safe right do not use the same password for everything right and social media attracts a lot of cyber criminals you have to always keep an eye on your social media account right not everyone who messages you will have something that is within your best interest at heart, right? So you have to be very cautious. Understand the importance of backing up your data and um, understand that cybersecurity is a moving target. I'm just going through these tips real, really quickly because I want to wrap this up as soon as possible. I don't like to, to talk for very long, right? Use a trustworthy security suite to help protect your devices. What that means is when buying a security suite, make sure you invest in a software that provides comprehensive protection for all your family members and their devices. 
All right. Now, that being covered, let's talk about skimmers, right? Now, I don't know how many of you are aware of what, or, of what skimmers are. They're also called grabbers. And they are um, small devices that can be attached to a point of sales machine, right? Whether it be at the gas station or supermarket, it's very small, you attach it to the point of sale machine. You will give that, that, that customer service representative your credit card or your debit card. They swipe it through and it, and it, and it copies your card and immediately as a good friend of mine would say, right, you get chopped right after. So it is very important that when we are navigating in and out every day, you watch closely who you're giving your personal information to, particularly in the form of your card, your credit card, your debit card. You want to see that person put the card through the point of sale machine so that you can ensure that it's not being cloned or copied. Because once that information gets in the wrong hands, a chop you get chop. All your information gone. Right? Another very important point, and this is the last point I want to speak on, is social media. The do's and don'ts of social media. Now, this is an ongoing debate. As a matter of fact, recently, I was speaking to Queen's Council Paula Llewellyn, our DPP, about the need for public agencies to have a social media policy. And it is very important that we as young people, especially young professionals, be very cautious of what we post on social media, right? I'm not saying that you don't have the freedom or liberty to post as you wish, but certainly you want to be cautious of what you post because as Justin pointed out earlier, your social media footprint in this 21st century is like a resume. And employers, persons who provide scholarships, people who may have an interest in you, who may not have access to you, will go on social media to find you. They'll check out LinkedIn, they'll check out Instagram, they'll check out Twitter, they'll check out Facebook. And you want to ensure that the content that you have on your social media pages is appropriate for consideration, right? Your captions are also very important. You may have the best pick in the world, but if your caption is not friendly, then it may not necessarily reflect who you are, right? And people want to know who you are. And at all times, you want to be cognizant of the fact that you are in control of what you put out. People will, many people will have different perspectives of you, especially with regards to what they can see on your, your social media. And specifically Instagram, because Instagram is, and, and Facebook, because Instagram and Facebook are the platforms that we use the most to share photos, whether of ourselves or our surroundings, or business, whatever it may be. People will perceive you based on what you post. So you want to be cautious, right? As a matter of fact, unfortunately, when you hold a high office or if you have a number of followers that's significant, then you may be a target to cyber criminals who may want to clone your page and, cl and use your identity for malicious purposes. Now, the Data Protection Act does provide penalties, a provision that, that outlines the penalties for breaching the act. It's $2 million or six months imprisonment 
for corporations that breach the Data Protection Act. And it's very important that we have legislation like this that protects our citizens. So with all that being said, and coupled with the presentation from Malika, I think for the most part, I have outlined basically everything that you may need to know, in addition to what Malika has presented, to protect yourself in this digital space. So just remember, be cautious, be in control. And I want to leave you with my mantra. It's not related to, to data or, or, or surfing the web, but certainly it's something that you can utilize in your day-to-day -day life. With God in the center, you can achieve anything you set out to do as long as you have the right attitude and willingness to work hard. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Demoy Carr, future lawyer. Thank you so much for dedicating your time and energy and your expertise in this field. So um, here, are there any questions, concerns, or suggestions? We'll let Mr. Demoy Coy, our legal consultant and Gil, to answer. Okay, thank you very much. Again, Mr. Demoy Coy, we keep in touch. All right, so moving along on the program to our final speaker. There's no way we could talk about um, self-defense and not have someone from the Jamaica Constable Force. So um, next speaker who I'll be introducing is Constable Andre Murray. So he has been assigned to the Communication Forensics, Forensics and Cybercrime Division as a cybercrime investigator till, since April 2016, during which he has been trained and certified as a digital forensic examiner by micro systemation AB, access data, group LSC, black box technologies, and basic technology. Additionally, he has been successfully completed courses in major investigative security awareness and cyber crimes investigation. With that said, he's offered with the principles governing the handling and investigation of digital evidence and artifacts. His duties among general police duties include, but not limited, to cybercrime investigations, identification and seizure of digital devices, data acquisition and recovery, documentation and analysis of information contained within and created with computer systems, computing devices, and other electronic devices. Please let Constable Andre Murray feel welcome. I go ahead, All right, good evening. I, I take it that everyone is hearing me. Oh, yes, we are. I take it that everyone is able to hear me as I um, as I'm speaking as it as now. But um, everyone is hearing. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. We're hearing. You're hearing. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. As Mr. Sterling would have said, uh, my name is Andre Murray once again. Good afternoon to the. Requisite um, ladies and gentlemen here in the Zoom meeting. Of course, as we, you know, as we approach, as we are actually in the, the this new age, this age of information and communication technology. And of course, we are we are. It is known as the well. This, we are we are actually in the the, the the era where we are experiencing what you call the Internet of Things. And what it means, therefore, is that. All devices are now connected and um, by connected everything 
we basically as an IP address and for those things that don't have an IP address or aren't able to communicate by an IP address, pretty much every device have a MAC address, all digital devices, so to speak. All right, so just delving into what cybercrime is, right? I'm sure we would have been all familiar with what cybercrime really is, but for those persons who may not be so acquainted with what cybercrime really speaks to, I'll just you know shed a little light on that. All right, so we said that cybercrime or computer really is basically a computer or digital um, device oriented crime, right? That involves a computer and a network, right? Of course, you don't want to bypass the fact that it does include by any means human interface. And by that, I mean that a human being must be involved in the equation for it to be amount to being a cybercrime, whether at the back end or the front end or after the fact and before the fact, right? So cybercrime, of course, we can, we can basically outline that there are a number of different cybercrimes, right? Many of which under the Jamaican law includes um, breach of the Cybercrimes Act, which means that accessing, one of which includes accessing someone else's data, whether it be a person or an entity or a company or organization, accessing that data for, by which you are not so allowed to. Right? For use either personal or, or malicious, that would be considered a breach of the cybercrime act. Um, there are many other breaches under the cybercrime that I will touch on, but let us let us let us get to why and how cybercrime became what it is. Right. So first, let us look at primarily the beginning of a digital influence, because that's really where cybercrime comes from. It comes from a digital place, that place where you know, once upon a time we had some, we had the the the, the walkie talkies, right? And um, of course, we would have we would have evolved past that. And so we are now at a stage where we are in use of smartphones. Now, once upon a time, phones were, weren't considered smart either, so we know exactly what we, where we are coming from. Phones were pretty much on a certain level, you could say, analog. But of course, now phones have become much smarter, which means that they are capable of doing much more things. They're pretty much like an unheld computer because I pretty much do everything from my phone. My phone is like the centerpiece of my entire day. All right. So let us say, how many persons, I'm sure, well, I can't ask for a raise of hands, that, that is sure. But how many persons, you know, that if you came out, if you left out of the house and came on the road and you realize that you left your cell phone, would have had to actually turn back for your phone. I, I would assume that almost everybody, everyone, and that is so, especially if you're going to the university, your phone is a centerpiece, especially in this age of the, po the COVID pandemic, where everything is being done online. Your phone has now become sort of like a center console for your day-to-day -day activity. All right, so look at, let us just delve into the beginning of digital influence. I would say a digital device, it's an electronic device that can receive, store, process our send digital information, right? And so by virtue of the plethora or the, an increase in, in digital devices that gave birth to a cyberspace, right? And by virtue of a cyberspace, of course, you know that all intentions aren't always going to be positive. And so on the back end, you have some person who will try to infiltrate other people's systems and do malicious things, do malicious coding and otherwise. And that gave birth the cybercrime, all right? So in a bit to, to kind of give you an overall look at where I am from, which is my section, being the Communication, Forensics and Cybercrime um, Department Division, right? It's a section within the JCF, which is the Jamaica Constabulary Force, with an effort to um, improve um, in investigative skills and intelligence gathering capacity as it relates to cybercrimes facilitated by digital devices. All right, this unit was basically established with a view and a mandate to tackle these crimes in Jamaica, right? Because we realize that there is a growing need for an investigative arm within the JCF to deal with investigations of this nature, all right? As a, as, on, another, on another hand, there is also it, there's also the need for us to have the JCF to have also established this unit because what happened is that almost every crime 
in recent times now have a digital component. Right? So we know that the CCTV footage is a part of the cybercrime um, fight against crime, and that has captured and that has helped in other investigation. We also know that every cell phone, every digital device also leaves a digital footprint, right? So whether it was used indirectly or directly, there, there is also an input into how the, that crime may have occurred, all right? And so that gave also birth to the need for somebody and some someone to actually be a, um, a fee with how to treat with these investigations. So we say that digital forensics is a form of um, forensic science that deals with recovery and investigation of material found in digital devices often in relation to a commission of a crime. Right? So that is pretty much straightforward. And now digital forensics, as it is, focuses on four major things. Those things basically um, encompasses computer forensics, video and audio forensics, and uh, mobile forensics, and pretty much any other digital component which would take into consideration cybercrime. So here at the Communication Forensics and Cybercrime Division, we focus mainly on four pillars of investigation. One, being computer forensics, two, being mobile forensics, three, being video and audio forensics, and four, and finally, being any other form of digital forensics. Because why I say, why it is categorized as any other digital forensics is because when you, see, when you think of digital forensic science, it is an evolving space. It is an evolving space because it is on the backbone of information and communication technology. And if you know, this is one of the fastest growing areas that we know to date because it's rapidly evolving and it's rapidly changing. So back in the days when we used to have those um, old computers, when we were connecting to the internet, you had to dial up to a modem and you hear the ngh, 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 and it's all of that. We are now in a different space where connection to the internet is almost instantaneous. So we understand that things have changed from the 1990s into the 21st century. And it's going to continue to change because the last conversation that I was watching on the, on the internet, I was following um, Elon Musk and he was saying that he has an uh, ambition to launch some 42,000 satellites out in space. And that will enable, for the most part, internet to be accessible in pretty much every section of the earth. And we, you know that the earth is a big place. There's many places on the earth that I've never, I've never been. So of course, you know that there's the Amazon and places like those where communication, of course, is almost null and void, right? Except, except for if you have a satellite radio. So he has an ambition to launch 42,000 satellites out in space, all right? So that to detract from that, but um, I also want to shed light on four principles um, that govern cybercrime and digital forensics. And the, in, and the, the principles that govern that, uh, that area um, is to ensure that no action taken by law enforcement agencies or their agents should change data held on a computer or storage media. And this has to do a lot with investigation. So I'm just getting you um, a thing with the backbone of what I do and so I can delve in further into cybercrime so you have a better idea and a better um, understanding. So one, no action taken by law enforcement agency or their agents should change data held on a computer or storage media, which may subsequently be relied upon in court. So investigating cybercrime, these are some things that must be adhered to. In circumstances, where a person finds it necessary to access in, um, original data on a computer or a storage media, that person must be competent to do so, right? Three, an audit trail or other record of all processes applied to the computer-based electronic evidence should be created and preserved. So it's important for an audit trail to be established and in so doing, the information must be able to be processed, applied, and also preserved so that it can be viewed by an external or internal personnel to see the integrity of the information. And fourth, and finally, the person in charge of that investigation, you the investigator or me the investigator, has an overall responsibility for ensuring that the law and these principles are adhered to. 
Alright. So, in the commission of cyber-related crime, as I said, this goes hand in hand with digital evidence, digital forensics, and so on. Where can information be found? Right? Cyber crime information can be found on flash drives, they can be found on routers, they can be found on computers, of course, they can be found on phones. So those are some areas where information where digital information can be obtained. Of course, another key component to the cybercrime these days are the credit and the debit cards. The credit and the debit cards I will give persons who we classify that as um, black hat hackers, an opportunity. And these are hackers who use their skill set and their competencies to do malicious or to carry out malicious tasks, whether for themselves or as a part of a group. Right? But we say that the credit card or the debit card, because it's an area that basically um, can be, to some extent, classified as um, money, so to speak that has really thrived over the past couple of years. And in cybercrime and cyberspace, the internet, as you know it, which is, you know, you type in, you go into your browser and you type in Google, and you Google, and it brings up that Google page, that search, the search engine, or you go into Yahoo and it brings up that search engine. But the cyberspace, it has a layer. The internet has a layer. Now, the internet that you are browsing is sort of like the tip of the iceberg. But there is a much deeper section to the internet, which we call the dark web. For those persons who are knowledgeable of that, or those, of those persons who don't know about the dark web, you can do your research on your own time. One way of accessing the dark web is using the Onion browser, right? Or what we call the Door browser, right? So you are able to access the dark web and on the dark web, persons will do a lot of things. There's a lot of things that you can access from the dark web. Credit card information and stuff like that is often sold on the dark web. And that is because, as I said, you're able to monetize it. It's something that you can get monetary proceeds from. And by virtue of that, there is always a buyer. And there is pretty much all, always a seller once there's a demand. So moving on from the credit card area, we can also look at the fact that we are in the information age. So of course, you can also monetize information because a lot of the time what you find is persons who are in possession of very crucial information or crucial data can be able to monetize it, right? Depending on the value of that information, right? So let's say you are on the the back, you, you are working with Apple. And of course, we know that the release of the new Apple iPhone is just around the corner. And if you know Apple, you know that Apple always pretty much keeps their information in terms of their schematics of their phones and the design and the OS that will go into it and all those different nice things. They always keep it a secret. They don't want to release it into the public space because of reason that their competitors may get that information and use it to, to better their devices, right? So let's say you got a leak or you got a schematic of how Apple will be designing their phones and all the different architecture in terms of devices that will be going into it. Of course, you could sell that to their competitor. In some respect, we call that cyber espionage. That's also another cyber crime because maybe you would have either hacked into Apple's system, hacked into a worker's computer, or pretty much you are working with Apple, but maybe you don't have authorized access to that part of your information and you would have unauthorized to unauthorized means get that information and sell it online there are persons on the dark web who may pay for it one such some such some such persons may include let's say persons who make who make phone cases those persons make millions of dollars from manufacturing phone cases for resale all over the world so of course, they would want to know what the phone is going to look like and the schematics of the phone and all that. So they can go into pre-production of 
phone cases because as soon as you purchase that phone when it releases, you're going to need a case for it, especially if you pay 1200 US or more for that device. All right, so looking into how we can monetize information that pretty much gives you an idea of why you would have cyber espionage, why people would steal information to monetize it, which is a form of cyber crime. Right? Let us also look at another cyber crime. What we classify as revenge porn. Now, in recent times, we have seen so much of that. So much of the of the incidences where persons would have been, you know, persons within the confines of their home or otherwise, couples and other and, all, and also other persons would have been engaged in um you know, romantic affairs. However, with the consent of your partner or your spouse, recordings will have been made of that engagement. I mean, what happens in your home is, of course, your privacy. However, providing that you and the person were no longer together, the person felt it was necessary, right, to release those videos, pictures, or information, whether it be a text message or so, on the internet on social media, on the porn hub, on the, 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 the exhibit videos and stuff like that. And now it's out there. There's no way to take it down because once it is stored on one person's device, it's pretty much everywhere. Every, every person's device is acts as a server, or acts as a node to a server. Because once the information is located on one person's phone, then of course you can always feed it to other persons and the information is out there. So revenge porn is also another, another, another issue of cybercrime. But by at the very top of the, of, the, of the totem pole, of course, you have the issue of scamming. And this is a sore point because it takes so many forms. And like any other criminal enterprise involved in the digital space, it is growing. Now, scamming, we call it, you, you might have heard some popular names, you've heard a lot of scamming. You would have heard um, all different things. You would have heard um, what they call it again, separate and apart from a lot of scamming. They call it um, back in the day. Um, I don't remember the term, but there's another term that they use. The more popular one is a lot of scamming. Right? Of course, this is a sore point because this is an area of cybercrime as well. Because what, what criminals use um, a multiplicit approach to, to getting funds sent to them by virtue of Western Union, or they use the monogram, or they pretty much to, um, invite other persons to, to skim cards. I see someone said something about social engineering. Of course, social engineering is the centerpiece of, of, what, of what happens when you're actually and you're trying to, to to convince someone or persuade someone to send you money um, from by virtue of having possession of identity information for that person because that is the centerpiece of how you can convince the person you must have some information or proceed to to, to let the person feel as though you have that information if not you are if not if, if you are the person who is going to you truly use a social engineer and get that information from the person, right? So we look at this, the scamming aspect. And um, of course, under the Cyber Crimes Act, right, 2015, because it was amended from 2013 and it was amended in 2016, to take, to take into consideration several other things, all right? So under the Cyber Crimes Act, we have the possession we have what they call the breach of the cyber crime that with the possession um, aspect, and we have the fraudulent transaction aspect, right? So possession speaks to having possession of identity information with an intent to use it. And of course, in the cyber crime space, we that is termed, and in the criminal underworld, it is termed as leads, right? So we might have heard the term even in the corporate world. I've heard, I've heard persons who do marketing and stuff like that use the term leads. Criminal also use the term leads. 
So leads basically a lead leads are leads are leads list is all is basically a compilation of a person a person's name and other information that is highly confidential that can include a person's social security number a person's TRN number but by their names addresses um, where they would have done business before and stuff like that. Now, criminal use that aspect, which is, which is termed the possession of the identity information, to carry out to carry out a breach of the law reform act. And the basis that they now use that information to contact persons, whether overseas or local, right, to inform them that through some means or the other, they would have won money and that to acquire the proceeds of what they would have won or to acquire the gift that they would have, they would have won. Uh, whatever they were selected from, a raffle or otherwise, they need to make payment in the form of um, money, right, to obtain the winnings. Now, this, as I said, takes many forms because it's an evolving space for criminal elements, right? So it's not just going, always going to be about, oh, you want something. It could have been that you were selected as a part of a promotion and to access the promotion, you need to make a payment of $50 or whatever it is. It takes many forms. So it doesn't always come in the form of a lottery. A lottery it doesn't always come in the form of a, of a, of a, of a, of, a, of, a, of the normal, um, normal operation, right? It could be that digital is doing a promotion and um, persons are expected to call and say, I'm going to digital call, you're expected to say the bigger, better network, right? And when persons call you and say, okay, you were selected, I'm so-and-so calling from digital, you are being selected in a um, part of a promotion and that you would have won $20,000. However, to claim your prize, you need to make a payment of $3,000, right? And the person go on and on and they convince you that they are working with digital. And if you are not so afraid with what is happening when you win um, a prize through Digicel, some persons who you know, you know, are easily persuaded, are easily convinced, right? They might have gone and sent the person money, only to be, only to find out that there's no, you you weren't selected and Digicel wasn't having any promotion, and even if they were, you were not part of the person selected in in winning that promotion, all right? So. We look at that as cyber crime. And, you know, like I think it's Mr. Daly would have said about social engineering. Social engineering is single handedly one of the most, um, what would I say, you know, one of the most um, plausible ways of, of, of committing um, any cyber related crime. Because a lot of the times, what, what you have now, especially, is that the different entities, the different online platforms that are beefing up their security as it relates to, to, to logins and stuff like that. So what you have there is an increase in two-factor authentication. And for those persons who don't know what two-factor authentication is, in layman terms, it's basically a secondary way of protecting your account, right? So in the event of two-factor authentication, right? Persons have realized that persons who, who have an intention to do things that are, you know, outside of are in breach of the cyber crimes app will find that they use social engineering. So in questions where it asks, what's the name of your eldest niece? There are different ways to get this information over the internet. You know, people use people use phishing techniques, right? By virtue of popular domains like um, let's say Facebook. Right, and they create a domain that looks exactly like Facebook, except on the end of the word Facebook, it has let's say a e. So Facebook, and at the end of book, it has an e dot com, and it brings it to a site because they know that based on person's keystrokes, person sometimes makes mistake in the in the in what they're typing into the the, the, the actual browser. So they, they, they bring it to another page that looks exactly like Facebook. And that information is prompting you to log in with an with a email and a password. And from the entering of that email and password, you might have had a two-factor authentication set up that asks you for that information. What's the name of your eldest niece? What is the name of your dog? Whatever. And so you put in that information. And someone at the end of the, 
the, the back end of that in um, that site, that fictitious site, gets that information and is now able, providing that your 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 login credentials stay the same, is now able to access your Facebook, which is a very personal space. All right. So in relation to that. And in relation to all those things, how can you better protect yourself? Protection, first and foremost, comes from the, the very simplest, right? And it goes up the line, goes up the chain. All right, so let us start from how you can protect yourself, because I can go on and on about the different cyber crimes. But the most important part is how to protect yourself. If you are using a computer, right? We know that the most important thing to do is to have an antivirus installed on your machine. And whilst that may not always be the most effective form of protecting your information and to protect yourself on the internet and to protect yourself in cyberspace, it is also a means of protection, right? So we say that having an antivirus is very important, right? Separate and apart from that, having a good firewall software is very important. Of course, yes, there are many antiviruses that provide firewall um, features, and the, the list goes on. You have the NART and you have the Kaspersky, you have the you have the Avast, and you have more, you know, you have more more robust um, ones out there. But it's very important to have an antivirus and uh, and um, of course a firewall installed on your machine. Separate and apart from that. The usage and the, the usage of information, especially when you, when you speak about your login credentials to your Google, to your iCloud. For me, iCloud is a very important place to protect because the iPhone doesn't store a lot of data. And most times the data stored on the iPhone, especially for those persons with limited storage, always stores majority information in your iCloud. And so iCloud is a very personal space for most people because they store their web history in there, their notes, their images, their videos, and stuff like that. Right? So protecting your login credential is also very important. How to do that? If you are logging into any of your online social media platforms or otherwise, whether it be that you're, you're logging into your, your online banking and stuff like that, if you are going to log into to, to that platform or any of those platforms from a computer that is not your own, be sure that when you log onto that platform, where it says save your password or remember me, ensure that that is not ticked. Separate and apart from that, it is not your machine, which means that you don't have use and control over that machine or that particular digital device all the time. So you can open what you call um, an incognito browser for those persons who are familiar with Chrome and those persons who are familiar with Safari and those persons who are familiar with Firefox and so on. You can open a private browsing tab. That way it doesn't save your cookie and it doesn't save your login information automatically. You know, when you go on the regular browser, sometimes you go to log into, let's say, Scotia or some other sites, and it automatically populates that field for you by putting in your at least your email. So you want to ensure that logging onto a site or an online platform that from a computer that is not your own, that you utilize these functions, the incognito function, the private browsing functions, and stuff like that. Where passwords are concerned, I see a, a growing need to make passwords more complicated. But it doesn't matter how complicated the, soft, the, the password is if you are not careful with your password. Now, your password for anything, it, it is a reason why it's called a password because it's not supposed to be available to pretty much anyone. So there's a greater need to protect your password. If you work in a space such as, you know, such as where I work, I have a forensic machine. I'm dealing with cases, right? that are highly confidential. It has cases involving persons um, being brought before the courts. Of course, my machine and, and all of my coworkers' machines are protected with a password, right? Now, it would make sense I'm protecting my computer with a password, only to write on a bit of piece of paper. 
and leave it on my desk. It makes no sense, right? It doesn't make sense for me to write in my diary and leave my diary accessible to pretty much anyone. So protection doesn't matter how complicated your password is. It matters about how diligent you are in protecting that information, right? So we said we look at password, protecting your password. Yes, making it as complex as possible so someone can guess it. So go on ideas where you're going to use a password and you're going to use your data bird. Come on. Everybody is on most. Even password, if there's such a thing as password for dummies, they're going to attempt to use their data bird. Most people, some people still do. I don't, I don't want to say most people. Some people still do. Are their child's data bird. Make it a little bit more complex. Make it a little bit um, less predictable. Use something that somebody may not necessarily can guess off the top of their heads, right? We say use, in some cases, you can use characters such as the ad sign and any type of character and symbol that you can possibly use to make it less, you know, you know, less harder to guess, so to speak. And we look at sharing. Now, another part of protection. So we looked at password, right? We look at the use of software such as um, antiviruses and firewall. And so now we are going to look at sharing. Now, protecting yourself also means less sharing, less, and, or, or what I put, what you would call oversharing. So, you know, some, you know, for, especially for persons who vlog online, I would have gone on a lot of people's um, um, sites and a lot of people's channels, and I would have watched them while they're vlogging. And you're able to social engineering, like Mr. Daly said earlier, if I'm getting his name correct, would have gone and they would have watched the vlogs and they can they would have garnered a lot of information through these vlogs. Some persons drive vehicles, not that their intention is to put the information out there, but they drive vehicles and their registration plate is in the vlog. Okay, fine. I got their registration plate. I know that they drive a black Audi, right? Registration plate, such and such number. Okay, okay, okay. All right, it's daily. All right, I got that one. All right, so we would have said that through social engineering, persons protecting and, and not oversharing is also important. So, like I said, from blogging, a lot of times I'm watching the blogs and I've seen person registration plate. I've seen places that are able to, that gives me the ability to deduce basically where they live. They share so much that I know exactly how they're how the dimensions of their house is set up. So if I were to go on a piece of paper based on watching the blog over time, I could basically draw a layout of the house, right? I know what their daughter's name and their son's names are. I know what schools they go to, right? I know what car their husband drives. Over time period, things said in these vlogs are things shared is able to build a dossier. And when I build up enough information, I can use that information to do different things. I know where you work because I you whilst you're vlogging, one of the times you had on a shirt with a logo on it, right? You stated in one of your vlogs that you are a direct marketing manager for so on such a company, right? I, based on the quality of the vlog captured in 4K, I was able to see a document that you signed your signature on. So oversharing is sometimes a part of the reason why cyber crimes have happened. So you have to be careful about sharing, how you share and what you share, and the forum and the space that you share it in, right? Because not everybody out there is actually looking for amusement. Some people are, some persons are looking for opportunities and the opportunities aren't always the ones that you want persons to have. So let us take that into consideration, all right? So we look at oversharing. Another area of protection, and this is one that you may not hear very often, is, 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 a, is about edifying yourself, making yourself more knowledgeable about the threats that are out there, right? The threats that are out there, one of which include, um, one of which includes social engineering, one of which includes phishing, Right? Like I said, phishing is also uh, another form of uh, 
um, opportunity, another form of feature that hackers use to get information, right? From time to time, we at the JCF, we have gotten phishing emails from persons, um, you know, pre pretty much um, creating a, 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 creating a, a, a email a name for a person that is not in the JCF. And that email is if you is basically sends um send us information and provide that you clicked on that email, it would have through that link would have brought it to a different space. And from by virtue of that space, there's some information that it either could basically execute a malicious code on your machine and start to get information and feed the person on the back end with, or it could have directed you to another page and from that page it starts to, to basically ask you to input certain information, right? So we look at deficient areas and we look at, and we look at um, social engineering and we look at oversharing. We look at software that are able to better protect yourself. And we look at the importance of not making some information available to other persons by virtue of where you write it down and where you store that data, all right? On your... On, the, on another level of protection, we are engaging in your service concern. That is paramount. But like I said, I can only tell you so much, but the cybersecurity space is an evolving space. And so sooner or later, things that we consider a threat now to our security, our data security, may be of the past. And, it, and there's going to be a birth of more things that we may need to look into. And I guess that is why um, incident response and cybersecurity personnel are one of the most sought after persons in terms of jobs. Because like I said, we are in the internet of things and there's, an, there's, a, there's, a, there's a vast amount of data being made available on the internet and persons want to protect it. Um, I don't know if there, as, as, I go, as I've gone through those bits of information, if there's anything that anyone would like to ask at, at this point that I can possibly clear up before I look at the laws that deals with um, the, the penalizing of breaches on the cyber security and the cyber crimes act. Is there any questions? Um, I had a, I had a few, but you had answered them while you were talking. But um, for another one, um. How are, do we have, um, seen that you're with the JDF, um, do we have the right data governance strategy to minimize cyber risk? Um, right, data gover governance strategy. I think, I think, I think in keeping with Vision 2030, there is, there is, there, the right approach is being taken by the JCF to, to to, to, to um, basically outfit the constabulary force with the requisite tools. And of course, they would have made a very brilliant and good step in the past to even have established this unit to represent the JCF. So of course, that is one big step in the right direction. Um, it's a very expensive venture. And once you mention IT, it's a very expensive venture. And so, a part of what I've always heard, not just in the in the JCF, but right across the world, is that because it's an expensive venture, it also bears down on the financial arrangements that have to be made to facilitate this growing area. Um, but I do think in support of the question that I think while the governance aspect of it um, I guess the biggest room to I think the JCF is doing a good job so far in what they have, what how they choose to, to progress with the fight against crime. Yes, sir Murray, I have a question for you. Yes, no problem. Um, how can we prosecute persons who may abuse um, their privileged sensitive information? For example, we see cases where um, students who may be in relationships, and I'm going to speak freely, who may be in relationships um, and those relationships get sour, who may share some information that they wouldn't necessarily want in the public domain to, to, to persons who abuse 
um, such information by posting it on social media, sometimes even asking for some fee in return in order to prevent them from, from posting it. How can we um, adequately gather enough evidence to prosecute those persons if possible? All right. Based on the nature of that question, once you start to use, once you start to invite the the fact that you, you want monetary proceeds to be paid over to you to in order to not post things that you would have obtained, right? Maliciously, or you'd have obtained through illegitimate means, right? That in itself, in it, 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 it to a lesser extent, it takes into consideration what we call um you know you depending on how the, the information was actually ascertained you could it, it it could come in it could say it could fall under ransomware you know because the, in cyber in the cyber crime space there's a term that we call ransomware right it's sometimes you by virtue of a malware that people use to get information but of course suppose i know that you are based on the type of person that you are i suspect that you have information that may be confidential and maybe compromising at the same time on your phone between you and your spouse. I'm going to take it from a, 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 a two sides, but I'm going to speak on the ransomware side first. So I know that you may have information on your phone or your computer that is very compromising. And I have reason to believe that based on your background, you may be able to pay, uh, you may be, pay, be able to pay handsomely to, to, to actually recover that information. If it were to go in, because if it were to go in the public space, it might affect your job, it might affect your marriage or whatever. So that can come on the come under the broad heading of a ransomware attack. Now, let us take it from the perspective that it's from a relationship that went so as you spoke. Now, depending on how that in that that actual thing took place, what I is that you and your spouse actually traded that information. So one person recorded, sent it to the other person, and, and you send it out there in the, in the public space. And you are, are, you are able, you're saying to the person, before I send it out, you know, in order for me to not send it out, you need to pay me, right? Depending on how the, the videos are, whatever material it was, data was obtained, the investigation can take different directions. If it were that I, to some means, accessed your, your laptop, took those videos off your laptop. That's a breach of the cyber crimes app on the basis of, on the basis of um, that, it, that, it, that, that I did not obtain requisite permission from you to access that data. And so we can proceed with, with, with you being charged, right? And depending on the nature of the damages, it can, be, it can mean a fine or it can mean prison time. Right, so it depends on how the data was 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 actually obtained. Now, if the data is if, if you recorded the the video or you took the pictures, right? Let's say in that case, because I'm just trying to touch on the different areas now, so I can you know bet, enable you to better understand. If it if it were that you took some pictures, made a video of let's say a, a girl under the age of 16 and you sent those pictures, you made those videos of her doing sexual favors and you sent those pictures out in the public space and when an investigation starts, it, it is borne out that you created and sent those pictures and disseminated those pictures over the internet. Now you can be charged, one, you can be charged for production of child pornography. It can be child charged in the distribution of child pornography in the event that it's a young lady or a young girl under 16, right? So that's one direction that we can go with it, you know. So we, we have seen, because we have actually investigated cases of that nature at the, at the, the, um, the Sissoka, at Sissoka, or found persons culpable and prosecuted them. Now, let's say the woman is, or the person, the, the girl, is older than 16. Now we take into consideration, how did you obtain that video? How did you come by the pictures? 
And so our investigation also takes a different form. Um, where you send it over the internet, irrespective of whether it was consensual or not, I'm sure a person wouldn't have consented you to upload it to porno. That's a defamation of character. And by virtue of that, the matter in relation to that can be civil because our schedule does, doesn't permit us to, to really get into to that aspect of the investigation. So that's more a civil case where you and your person would have made a video and the person sent it on social media, right? And so it defamed the person's character and what they stand for. That is a more civil matter. And so that will have to be taken out, taken up in the civil courts for, uh, for the matter to be addressed and how to deal with it going forward. Did I answer your question? Uh, you did, you did, but um, what I will, and first I want to say I really appreciate the insight that you have given um, yeah. in answering the question, but I want to say that in my view, it's unfortunate that it is merely a civil matter because let's say for example, and this is a scenario, myself and, and Marika are in a relationship. And like I said, we, 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 it went sour, but before it went sour, we exchanged personal photographs with each other. And um, by virtue of it being sour, um, one of us decides to leak, quote unquote, those photographs on the internet, social media, wherever. Um, it, it's unfortunate in my view that um, the, the JCF may not have the jurisdiction to, to, to perhaps prosecute um, in that regard. Is that what you were saying? No, the, 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 matter, is, it's, the matter can be taken up from the JCF. Um, pers well, the JCF, the matter has to be reported, certainly. And then how, how is it going to be reported? It must be reported to the Jamaica Constabulary Force. Now, when it is reported, of course, the report will be appreciated, right? And you would be issued with a receipt to say that your receipt, your, 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 and your statement will be recorded as well to say what happened. But I'm saying in relation to, to finding the person culpable, an investigation must be, um, an investigation maybe, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe um, launched into what happened, but it is more a civil matter as opposed to a criminal matter. You get what I'm saying? I get you. I get exactly what you're saying. So, even if we investigate it and we find out that the person is culpable of distributing compromising images of, of you, it's not something that we are going to approach from a criminal perspective. It is going to be a more, a more civil investigation as opposed to a criminal investigation. Now, if the person, without your permission, um, access your laptop, so took these images from your laptop, that, that's, that's where it gets criminal. You understand what I'm saying? I certainly understand what you're saying. Right. That's where it gets criminal because the person would have illegally obtained these, these, these things because you would have not given the person um, permission to access your laptop. You would have not given the person password um, to access your laptop or your iCloud or your phone or whatever, but the person took it upon themselves to use whatever means they had at their disposal to access it. So but that's a breach of the cyber crimes act right there. So that so that's a that's a criminal investigation starting right there. But so I think you would... that you both send to each other. Yes. I sent it to you, you sent it to me. We were happy during the time, we laughed about it, we found it, you know, whatever. And then now something the relationship went so the person sent it out. The obtaining of the of the actual image and video was not illegal, as you guys would have said, okay. You, you consented to it, right. We consented to it, being a major part of it, right? So, of course, sending it out now, how did it impact on you, the person? Of course, it impacts on your character. It right. impacts on what you represent. So that is why it becomes civil. That's nothing it illegal was done. Right. Nothing illegal was done to obtain it. But it, well, was, done, it, it was done outside of your knowledge to disseminate it. Yes. In my opinion, um, and this is just my opinion, I think it should become um, a criminal matter um, when, when instances like these occur. I believe that there are some jurisdictions, um, perhaps the United States, where instances like this are, are, are 
are prosecuted by the office of the, well, in their jurisdiction, what would be the office of the DPP, of course, the JCF having investigative powers. So I think um, our, our, our jurisdiction needs to get to that point where it, it moves beyond merely civil um, to a, a criminal um, offense. Another question for you, Sir Mori. Um, if I am hacked, if my Instagram or Facebook account is hacked, right? Um, yeah. and, and I, I make a report that it is, it is hacked. Is it possible for the JCF to investigate and perhaps bring someone um, before the court to be, to be prosecuted in that regard? All right, first and foremost, they use the operative word, they use the word hack. Now, once you use the term hack, I, I suspect that by virtue of the term hack, you're meaning, it means therefore that no permission was given to the person to access your, your, your Instagram handle. Certainly. But someone, or some, somehow somebody accessed your Instagram handle, may have even locked you out of your, 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 your login, so you're, you're unable to even log back in. Um, how does the JCF proceed with such a case? Um, I think that's one area that we have, um, we, 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 we want to be able to, to tackle head on, but that in itself, as it relates to our schedule of offenses at the Cybercrime Division, is not actually on our mandate. And so, it, it, it gives us a little, it gives us um, some sort of uh, less powers to deal with a, 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 an investigation of that nature. While, we, while the JCF is equipped to appreciate the report, the actual investigation of that nature um, doesn't necessarily fall under our mandate. If it's a case where it involves hacking and perhaps it's coupled with another offense, let's say threat, then it becomes a whole different thing. But if it's just hacking and um, you, there's hardly any motive to establish from it, then there's, there's not much we can do to investigate that. I see. Okay. Thank you very much, Sir Mori. Anyone else with any questions? Of course, I am um, more than willing to answer it. But as it relates, so let me just oh, touch a bit on the, the, the legislative framework, right? So under offenses under the, the Cybercrime Act, for those persons who may want to take notes, of course, I'm going to have a slide which I will be making available to Mr. Davian Sterling that um, he can disseminate to you guys. And this will pretty much enlighten you a bit on the offenses under the Cyber Crimes Act 2015, section three to 10. It speaks to unauthorized access to computer data or program. It speaks to access with the intent to commit or facilitate the commission of an offense. It also speaks to unauthorized modification of computer data or program. Unauthorized inception of a computer function or service. Unauthorized obstruction of a computer operation computer-related fraud and forgery, use of computer for malicious communication, right? Unlawfully making device or data available for the commission of an offense. So Mr. Uh, the gentleman that we were speaking to, speaking to a while ago, what we were talking about had a lot to do with the use of malicious, um, the use of a computer for malicious communication, right? But how do we proceed with the investigation will be dependent on how the data was obtained or how access to that computer or malicious information, how, how, you, how access was given to the computer or the data for the use of a malicious, for the use of malicious communication was obtained. So that is also very important. Um, in, an, uh, in, 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 a, in a sort of an article that was published by DPP, it, it, it states that it is imperative and most useful that access involving sending of commu communications data via computer undergo early consultation between before police and prosecutors. And the police are encouraged to contact uh, the prosecution at any early stage. And that is, as I said, because 
there are so many avenues to cybercrime. So sometimes there are, there are areas that require investigation that needs consultancy because depending on the nature of the investigation, some things you know you have to really consult to know where the law provides for that, how to proceed. All right. I'm just going to, you know, basically just give you a synopsis. Section 9 of the Cybercrime Act 2015 states that a person commits an offense if that person uses a computer to send another person any data, whether in the form of a message or otherwise, that is obscene, constitutes a threat, or is menacing in nature, and with the intention to harass any person or cause harm or the apprehension of harm to any person. Right? So that is in the, I think in a case of malicious communication. But like I said, I would be making my entire um, PowerPoint presentation that I would have used on so many different lectures available to Mr. Sterling for dissemination. So you guys can go through it on your own time. And um, should you require any further understanding, of course, he can always come, um, being a chairperson, he can always liaison with me and I will be make, I'll be making more information available to him periodically, if so, if he needs, if he, if needs be. All right, uh, Mr. Maurice, I'd like to thank you for dedicating your time and energy and also information um, on this issue of cybercrime. The reality is a lot of um, individuals don't really pay much attention to it. And I really think going forward, I hope the JCF is Cybercrime Unit and for Forensics will actually um, think about launching a campaign about this because everyone is using online devices. The demand for online devices and internet has grown tremendously. So I really think that if a young person, the kindergarten, the primary, the high school, if everyone is um, informed about the do's and don'ts, the possibility of these um, cases will, will decrease. So the commuting students office, let's say, say a big thank you, and also all the participants who have been here from one o'clock and still here two hours after, I'd like to thank you for being here. And I see questions were asked, so thanks again. And we'll definitely be in touch because uh, this is a very important initiative and i really think this um deserves a larger platform and different stakeholders going forward so thanks again sir yeah, man. So, thanks thanks for having me and it was a pleasure um, um in closing i just want to share uh, a bit of information um for those persons who have an um have a uh, uh, have a city need to familiarize themselves with what is happening in the world there's a website that I'm going to suggest that you guys can check out at, on your own time. It's very informative and it speaks a lot on what is happening in the world that they relate to cybercrime, digital forensics, and stuff like that. The name of the site is called Security Week. So you guys can check it out. You can just Google it, 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 it will be there. Um, um, could you put it in the chat? Could you type it in the chat? Because we don't yes. see here so clearly. In the chat. Okay. All right. Well, I'm just going to say it over, but I'm going to put it in the chat nonetheless. It's called securityweek.com. Okay. That's Security Week, S-E-C-U-R-I-T-Y -E 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 On the site, it has some tabs that speak to malware and threats, cybercrime, mobile and wireless, risk and compliance, security architecture, security strategy, and um, the Internet of Things security. So on that side, it keeps you pretty much up to date with what is happening in the world as it relates to cybercrimes and stuff like that, all the different things that are happening across the world. It's sort of like my go-to place for maintaining um, 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 a, a solid knowledge base as it relates to what is happening all over the world. So I'm going to put it in the chat so you can check it out. All right, so all right. thanks again for having Mr. Sterling and you guys do have a great one. You too, sir. Thanks again, sir. All right, all right everyone. So this is our first um, episode of Self Defense Session. The next episode will be in our commuting week. So we this um, program focused on virtual. The next time we focus on physical, because the reality is although we're doing everything online, we also interact face-to-face. -face. 
So that is the, um, the theme for the next one. So thanks again, everyone, for joining. Enjoy the rest of the day. And thanks again for being here. And I'm sure the information shared, you will not only keep it to yourself, but you share with your peers and family members. So take care, everyone. Oh, could they, the host um, end the meeting? A meeting for all?